supply of air to simulate conditions of flight. This air is supplied to the front end of the engine at a pressure and temperature equal to those found at flight speeds. And the way a ramjet works is it's like a flying stovepipe. So you have a, a big force pushing in the front and a higher force pushing in the back to uh, provide thrust. You have the drag on the front end that you have to overcome, and you overcome that drag by ejecting a hotter air out the back end that has higher velocity and provides thrust. And usually the performance of a ramjet is the difference between two large numbers. And so uh, you better be sure you know how to calculate both those numbers, because it may turn out that, that if the, the pushing back number is uh, bigger than you thought and the, and the pushing forward number is smaller than you thought, you may in fact not be able to fly. Uh, to give you an idea, we were looking at forces on the reactor acting to push the reactor out of the, out of the missile of like 250,000 pounds. And the net thrust for such a system was going to be something like 35,000 pounds. Pluto's design called for a reactor operating at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The inlet air at Mark III would be just over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The exit air after the reactor would be around 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Conventionally powered ramjet materials need to withstand slightly lower temperatures. Having the heat source at temperatures near the limits of these materials results in the maximum generation of thrust. But a heat source too close to these limits can cause materials to fail. The mission power for the desired warhead uh, was 500 megawatts for, for that uh, uh, low altitude Mach 3 condition. And Livermore thought we had better do a prototype at a fraction of the 500 megawatts, and so the Tory 2A program was initiated to do a 50 megawatt prototype. The challenges facing the engineers and physicists at Livermore included supplying the reactor with air at a pressure and temperature that would simulate Mark III flight. They also had to combine materials that would function in a radiation environment at temperatures well above those where conventional materials lose their strength. We had many problems to overcome, but two of the problems to overcome had to do with neutronics inside the reactor and how those behaved with change in temperature. And the other had to do with the dynamics of flow through a reactor at these extremely high pressures and temperatures and how to make materials that would withstand those mechanical forces at those high temperatures and those high pressures. The behavior of neutrons lies at the core of reactor design. A fission reaction is either fast or moderated. In a fast reaction, neutrons are not slowed down, requiring a larger and more expensive amount of nuclear fuel. In a moderated reactor, atomic elements close in mass to a neutron slow the neutrons emerging from the fission process. For sustained flight, it's economically practical to utilize a moderated reactor. Beryllium oxide is a very good moderator. Beryllium has got a low atomic number, and, and you want low atomic number materials that don't have high absorption cross-sections to moderate neutrons, to slow down the neutrons so that they can be captured by the uranium and cause fission. Beryllium oxide is a uh, ceramic that uh, has good high temperature properties, has very good thermal conductivity, and um, is compatible with uranium oxide. And so we mix beryllium oxide with uranium oxide uh, to produce uh, fuel elements. So all these fuel elements look like pencils, hexagonal uh, outside cross-section with a hole going through it, of course, for the air to pass through to cool it. In a moderated reactor, the nuclear fuel can either remain separate from the moderator or be physically combined with the moderating material. When the fuel and the moderator are kept separate, you have what's called a heterogeneous reactor. 
Unfortunately, uranium on its own forms a volatile oxide when heated to a high temperature and exposed to air. The Project Pluto reactor was to be operated in the atmosphere, as air is essential to a ramjet's function. The fuel and the moderator were combined in what's called a homogeneous reactor. Air would flow through the reactor and the uranium did not have to be separated from the oxygen. When you do a reactor, the question is whether the geometry should be circular elements or hexagonal elements. Hexagonal elements nest very nicely as the bees found out in early times. So our fuel elements were hexagonal and if you look at your lead pencils, that's sort of what the hexagonal face-to-face -face dimension was. Mixing highly enriched uranium with beryllium oxide must be done in a highly controlled atmosphere. Lawrence Livermore Labs initially mixed their own fuel elements and then contracted this work out. The fuel elements in 2A were made by the Evendale plant of General Electric. The fuel elements for 2C were done by Coors Porcelain in Golden, Colorado. It was a new activity for them and, uh, and, and they did it uh, as General Electric had with, uh, with full success. There's a hazard of beryllium oxide. It's very toxic. It attacks the lungs and gives a very bad convalescence or if there's large exposure, an ugly death. We were faced with the handling of half a million kind of numbers of fuel elements. We had to inspect each fuel element to make sure that the ceramic fabrication had been successful and that there weren't any cracks. Cracked fuel elements might eventually plug the reactor, blocking airflow and causing a catastrophic failure of the ramjet. Fuel elements were inspected with the Zyglo test. The elements are coated with Zyglo and cracks are easily visible under a blue light. The nuclear core assembly for the Tory 2A was a cylindrical structure composed of about 100,000 tubular fuel elements. The core was divided into sections held in place by a skeleton of unfueled beryllium oxide links. These are pinned together by tie rods. The weight of the core rests on the links, which are supported by the tie rods. Using a nuclear reactor as a heat source for a ramjet missile at low altitude and supersonic speeds produces tremendous mechanical stresses. A change in air pressure through the reactor results from increase in temperature in the airflow. From the front end of the reactor to the back, this change in pressure is in the order of hundreds of pounds per square inch. These loads increase in concentration at the points where the reactor is anchored to the missile. As the heat from the reactor is imparted to the airstream, thermal stresses are created in the reactor materials as well. These stresses are in the order of thousands of pounds per square inch. Gravitational forces associated with a supersonic flight must be taken into account as well. In the Tory reactor, these forces are carried to the back of the reactor where base plates transmit the load to the tie rods, anchored at the relatively cold front. This distribution of mechanical stresses allows the use of the relatively brittle beryllium fuel elements necessary for a moderated reactor. These are the base plates that would have been at the end of the reactor. They are made out of uh, rather exotic materials. This is, uh, uh, this one here is actually from the Tory A engine, and this is from the Tory C engine. They include rather exotic materials that were developed for uh, standing up to the extremely high temperatures of the Tory reactor. You get an idea also from just the heft of these, uh, how big and how massive uh, Pluto would have been. It would have been literally the, uh, the size and mass of a steam locomotive uh, traveling at Mach 3. The design and construction of the first test reactor for Project Pluto was half the task for Livermore. 
Static tests to prove its capabilities would also need to be done.